common misconception that people with ADHD can't focus on anything. But that's not true. We can't just focus on things, you know, because we're supposed to, you know, in order to stay married or not fail out of high school. <laughs> but if something is especially interesting to us, whatever that happens to mean to us personally, or if it's urgent or novel or in some other way captivating, we can actually hyper focus. And that's the ability to hone in on every excruciatingly small detail of a subject for God knows how long. And that ability is where cures for cancer can come from. And also, where my history Super Bowl halftime shows flip chart comedy bit comes from, guys. Now, this is the first flip chart comedy bit that I ever put together. And it came about because several years ago, I had a podcast with my sports stat expert husband. And one of the very first episodes was recording the day of the Super Bowl. She doesn't know me, but still finds this hilarious. <laughs> the day of the Super Bowl, right? And I didn't care about what team right, won or who was playing, but my brain seized upon the halftime show. And of course it did. It's all glitter and shiny objects. You guys want to see how it turned out? Yes. Trick question, because we're doing it either way. All right, make some noise for me if you were born after 1980. Make some noise for me. Clap if you're born after. Great, great. You guys are the problem. You're the problem. You're why we have to talk about this shit, guys. It's not really your fault, right? Because if you were born after 1980, you think the Super Bowl halftime show has always been like Prince or Beyonce, or Springsteen, or whoever's better than Coldplay that year. <laughs> and it hasn't always been like that, guys. It took us decades to get our Super Bowl halftime rights. And if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat it. So look, I'm going to go over some things. We're just going to go through the first like 15 or 20 years. It's going to fly by. 1967, and we're in Los Angeles for the first Super Bowl ever. Who do you think they got for that first halftime show entertainment? Remember, it's the 60s. Oh, look, it's Grambling State University marching band, guys. <laughs> and, and jazz trumpeter Al Hurt. That's his album cover. It's called The Happy Trumpet. <laughs> All right. Okay, but it was their first one. They had to get their sea legs under them, right? Okay, year two. It's 1968. We're in Miami. Who says year two fun like these folks? Grambling State University marching band again, guys. Oh, look, they're the only headliners this year. That means they fucking crushed it last time. This is a promotion. Good for them. Good for them. Okay. It's 1967. We're back in Miami and it's the Florida A&M marching band, and then they trot out just a bunch of high school marching bands. Terrible, does not deserve pictures, moving on. <laughs> 1970, new decade, fun decade, and we're in New Orleans, fun town New Orleans, who says fun like this gal, Carol Channing. <laughs> Carol Channing. Even in 1970, she was 105 years old. <laughs> Best known for playing the role of Dolly in the Broadway show, Hello, Dolly, in 1917. Firecracker of a show, guys. All right, it's 1971. We're already five years in. It's 1971, five years in, in Miami. Who says fifth anniversary, big time entertainment like these folks, up with people, up with people. And if you don't know them like clearly this one and only woman in the back does, it's because you don't know who the fuck they are. So I'm going to explain it to you guys. Up With People was a huge singing and dancing troupe made up of a thousand ultra clean cut, mostly white kids between the ages of 18 and 22. And they used to force them on us at huge events like the Super Bowl for years and years. And they were a cross between the Mouseketeers and Hitler Youth. Yes, and they used to run out on the field and do like elevator music versions of ACDC songs and it was really fucked up 
and it took us a long time to get rid of the millennials. You are welcome. All right, it's 1972. We are back in New Orleans. Who do we got? Oh my God, it's Carol Channing and Joshua Burrell are together. Together, the happy trumpet and hello, Dolly. Guys, this is a Woodstock of Super Bowl halftime shows. You'd be telling your grandkids about it if you'd been there. All right, it's 1973, it's in Los Angeles, Andy Williams, blah, who cares, nobody, moving on. It's 1974, and this time we're in Houston, Texas, and the band is the University of Texas Longhorn Marching Band, and their headliner is Miss Texas 1973 on the fiddle. She was never even fucking Miss America, guys. She's a year out of office of Miss Texas already. This is bullshit. This is amateur hour. This is nepotism. America deserves better. Okay. It's 1975. We are back in Miami. Who are they going to get to bring us back to some dignity? Because this last one was awful. Who are they going to back, get back to class things up? Who do we got? Oh, it's Grambling State University marching band again, guys. Oh, thank God. They got, they brought the pros back. They know they fucked up last time. They fixed it. By the way, these are the heroes of our story, in case you can't tell. All right, it's 1976, and now we're 10 years in, and it's the bicentennial of the nation. Just take my word for it, young people. It was a huge fucking deal. There was a parade every day. Who says big time Bicentennial entertainment like these folks, up with people. <laughs> people. Because nothing says melting pot of America like a thousand white kids in spandex doing jazz hands in unison. 1977. And now we're in Pasadena, very near LA. And officially, the halftime entertainment is the Los Angeles Unified All City Band, which is a, a band made up of kids in public school music programs all over LA County. But they were fronted by a bunch of child actors who were about to go on and play the brand new Mouseketeers in the brand new Mickey Mouse Club in the brand new Disney Channel. All that stuff was new in 77. And this is their biggest star. This is Lisa Welshel. And Lisa Welshel would go on a few years later to play Blair on The Facts of Life making her the most important pop culture Blair till I become famous for doing this bit. All right. It's 1978. We are back in New Orleans. Who do we got? Jazz Trepid or Al Hurt, guys. If you have never heard of him before tonight, you will never fucking forget him now. All right, we're coming into the home stretch. It's 1979. We are back in Miami. And it's Ken Hamilton and various Caribbean bands. That's how they're built. But here's the thing, there are no straight on, in focus pictures of that halftime show anywhere on the internet. That show was so awful that the NSA had them disappeared. <laughs> all right, it's 1980, it's another new decade. And we have all the bands of the 60s and the 70s to choose from, most of them are still alive, right? And MTV is right around the corner, so we know music on television is going to be really important. Maybe this is where it comes together. Who do we got? Oh my God, it's Upland People! <laughs> and Grambling State University Marching Band together! Together! Come on, dude, this would blow your fucking mind! Are you kidding me? This is a Super Bowl halftime show all-star team we got going on over here. It's the best we got. 1981. We're back in New Orleans, and it's Helen O'Connell, billed as the quintessential big band singer of the 1940s. Or as I call her, the chick you get when Carol Channing's already been booked elsewhere that year. <laughs> All right, this is the last one we'll do tonight. It's 1982, and now we're 15 years in. So I think we know that the Super Bowl and the halftime show is going to be sticking around. And this is interesting. It's not in New Orleans or Miami. It's in Pontiac, Michigan. It's basically Detroit, if you're from New Jersey. <laughs> so it's in Detroit, 
15 years in, and the theme is a salute to Motown. All right, guys, 15 years, salute to Motown in Detroit. This is where it comes together. Who do we got? I'm with people. <laughs> with people. That's who said Motown to the NFL. And that is the end of the comedy club bit, the history of Super Bowl halftime shows. You may want to applaud under the Tinkerbell rule at this point. Thank you very much. Now, now that you know from the intro a little bit about ADHD, it may not be so surprising that somebody with a brain like mine might come up with a bit like this, right? But in the months and really years, it took me of rewriting this bit and trying it out at open mics over and over again to make it better. I learned that if I was gonna really make something out of those special visions I have, those hidden patterns and connections, so that other people could see what I see, I was also gonna need my ADHD brain to be resourceful, creative, and resilient. And those are lessons I learned and then was reminded of over and over again by the first Super Bowl halftime show producer. I know a lot about him. He didn't make it to the comedy club bit, but I think you'll like his story. His name is Tommy Walker. Now, Tommy Walker was a child prodigy musician in the 1930s. He was a trumpeter. He toured all over Europe and the United States. He was in the movie Mr. Smith Goes to Washington. When World War II broke out, he enlisted, earned a Bronze Star, and after the war, he returned to the States and enrolled at the University of Southern California, where he became the drum major of the marching band, and also, he kicked the extra points for the football team. <laughs> Do you understand what I am telling you right now? No, you can't. He's, a, he's over there in the marching band, right? He's in the stands, right? With the big ass hat and the huge stick. And then it's halftime, and he leads the band out into the field. And it's la, 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 music, music, music. And he leads them back up into the stands. And then I guess every once in a while, a coach runs over to the railing and says, hey, Tommy, can you come down here and kick this extra point? And I don't know how yet, what, it's fuck exactly. Right, if you're confused, you're getting it. Yes. <laughs> Right, and I don't know how well you can see this picture, but he's setting up his own kick. And he's still got his band hat on. And I bet that happened more than once. Because for real, he used to just wear his football uniform under his band regalia. And then I guess when he had the kick, he'd do like a Clark Kent into Superman thing up there in the stands and run down and kick that extra point. And he was legit good, right? He was such a good kicker that he was scouted by many professional teams, but turns out that's not where his heart was. He wound up going back to the University of Southern California and became the on-staff band director. He became known for putting on fun, quirky halftime shows at college games all over Southern California. So much so that eventually he caught the eye of Disney and they made him the director of entertainment. And on that job, he every day was just a master class in learning on putting on big public celebratory events, especially those that ended in spectacular fireworks displays. And some years into this job, this new Super Bowl thing came knocking on Tommy's door. And you gotta understand the context a little bit right back then. There was no Super Bowl, that none of them had ever happened yet. It wasn't even called the Super Bowl yet. And they wanted Tommy to put on a kick-ass halftime show, oh, but with like no budget and no help. And Tommy did it. He left Disney and took this risky gig. And he put together that very first Super Bowl halftime show, right? You remember we had Grambling State University marching band. They're our heroes. We had another marching band, right? And then pulling from his history of doing like those college game halftime shows, he had a lot of quirky acts. Like he had, this, he had these jetpack guys, these jetpack guys flying around the stadium. And look, there's probably maybe you know, 15 minutes of this show that could have been in it that I have cut for time that is about Tommy Walker and his history of using jetpack guys at events, and it's fascinating, and you should Google it. So he's got these jetpack guys, and he needs a headliner. So he calls in a favor to a friend who's a fellow trumpeter, 
right? And is also the music director for the hottest show on TV back then, The Green Hornet. And that's our friend, Al Hurt. <laughs> and a few minutes ago, we're all laughing about Al Hurt and that first halftime show. And I've encouraged many audiences to laugh at that over the years. But screw me, really, because Tommy made this shit out of nothing, right? Nothing at all. And people liked it, at least like 1967 in the daytime family-friendly level of fun. <laughs> so much so that they hadn't come back, and he produced several other halftime shows for the Super Bowl. And his new career just kicked off from there. He became a world-famous producer of big public celebratory events including the opening and closing ceremonies of a couple Olympic Games. Then, in 1986, he got what he considered to be the biggest, most important gig of his career. He was enrolled to be the executive producer of the centennial celebrations of the Statue of Liberty here in New York. And of course, he imagined the finale being the biggest and best fireworks display of his career with that statue as its perfect backdrop. But as planning got underway, the powers that be said, you know what, Tommy? We're gonna have the president and maybe 10 million uh, tourists down here. So we think maybe that's stashing explosives uh, all over Liberty Island in lower Manhattan <laughs> might be a bad idea. Uh, we're gonna need you to come up with a different ending. And Tommy said, oh, hell no. No, 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 no. We're doing the ending my way. But I understand your safety concerns, so I'm gonna call in a favor to another friend of mine, this time in the federal government. And I'm gonna get him to give me a bunch of Navy SEALs to put under my direction to keep all the fireworks safe. And he did it! He got the federal government to give him a bunch of Navy SEALs to put under his direction to keep all the fireworks safe. And look, I'm not saying this is the best use of our taxpayer dollars or whatever but I admire the chutzpah. <laughs> and Tommy got that biggest and best fireworks display of his career, which happened to be just a couple months before he died. So yeah, when I was putting together this bit, a lot of people, comedians, comedy bookers, sometimes audience members, told me they thought it was gonna be too weird or annoying. Guess what? Some still do. <laughs> but you know who wouldn't give up on flip chart comedy? Do you know who would embrace that tornado and make it bigger? Tommy the mother loving toe walker. That too. Yes. Absolutely. Now, was Tommy ADHD? I can't prove it. Except look at his whole life! She was a